Hi everyone. So we all know that we can study the brain function across a lot of different perspectives and scales. For example, if we look at the spatial scale of events and spatial resolution in this case, we can study the whole brain, but we can also focus on specific brain networks or brain regions, and we can even go further than that in neuronal circuits, etc., etc. The same goes for the temporal scale of events. We can study indirect measures of neuronal activity, like the bold signal of fMRI, but also more direct measures like local field potential or a single unit activity, etc., etc. When it comes to the temporal scale of events, we can even interpret it in a different way and study the brain function over time in the brain development. Ultimately, the goal of both clinical and preclinical research, one of the goals, is to be able to better understand the human brain. And that's why it's more and more important from the preclinical perspective to um, be able to translate our results towards higher order mammals, but eventually to the human. So in this presentation, I'm going to describe three main advant advances uh, that we implemented in our lab. Uh, on how we can better translate our results to uh, clinical use. So the first one is a dual imaging setup. The second one is about a novel methodology to uh, trans, um, transfect the, neuron, the neurons in the brain for GCAMP expression. The third one is a method that I developed for awake imaging in a scanner. So for the dual imaging setup, that's the core of our um, experimental um, setting. And it's based on the combination of fMRI and wide field calcium imaging. So fMRI is a great uh, technique that allows to have non-invasive whole brain access. And that's why it's um, widely used in the clinic. And um, it's going to work as our common denominator between the preclinical work and the clinic. Uh, however, there are a couple of limitations. For example, it provides indirect uh, measures of non-cellular specific signal of the brain, and also it has a lower, uh, relatively lower spatial temporal resolution. This is why in our case, we combine it with a wide field calcium imaging methodology, which on, on that side uh, allows for a more direct access to neuronal activity, and also has a much higher spatial temporal resolution. Uh, although, of course, it's a non-invasive technology, which uh, therefore is not applicable to humans yet. But that's why the idea here is to combine these two in order to bridge the gap on one end to have a more invasive but more direct access to the brain, and on the other end to have something that is translatable to the clinic. So in order to apply our dual imaging system, we need a glowing brain, so a brain that expresses GCAMP or any floor for, for calcium imaging, and after we have a glowing brain, we need to expose the skull to, in order to see the brain with a fibroscope for calcium imaging. So we will do something called skull thinning. Uh, so we remove the skin from the head of the mouse and we expose the skull. And then we manually drill the skull to make it optically transparent, but extremely smooth and intact. Then we place a optic window, glass window on the head together with glue and dental cement that will give us permanent access to the cortex of the mouse brain without having any air um, infiltrations. So once we have this, then we place the fibroscope on the head of the mouse. The fibroscope will shine blue and UV light onto GCAM positive neurons, and then we can record the activity of these neurons back in the same fibroscope through a camera positioned in an adjacent room. All of this is done inside the fMRI scanner, which means that we have simultaneous access to uh, 3D fMRI data on one end and 2D calcium imaging data on the other end of the cortex of the mouse. Now, one of the biggest challenges here is how to merge these two very different types of data. So what we do in the MRI side is that we acquire an angiogram that shows the vasculature on the mouse brain. So then we can map, following the blood vessels, we can map the optical imaging from the calcium imaging side to the angiogram, which allows us then to move all the 2D data onto the 3D space. So here I'll just show you, we image the animals four times across a year of the lifespan 
four, six, nine, and 12 months. And I just want to show you here that the implant lasted very well on the head of the mouse. Of course, by 12 months, we can see that the preparation starts to deteriorate. However, this mouse had the implant on for more than nine months, which was incredible. And at the same time, we can see stable calcium signal and fMRI signal over the four sessions. So um, with this dual imaging system, we can really leverage the non-invasiveness of the fMRI. And at the same time, because we use um, uh, GCAMP express, uh, express in a specific uh, cell population, we can extract meaningful specific um, signal from the uh, calcium imaging side. And we can apply this longitudinally on animals that can have the implant permanently on the cortex for um, the entire life. So after the dual imaging system, I want to describe the novel methodology for inducing GCAMP expression in the brain. So there are two main methods for um, GCAMP expression in the mouse brain. The first one is genetically encoded calcium indicators, and the second one is by injecting locally uh, a adeno-associated virus for GCAMP expression. So with the genetically encoded calcium indicator, that's by far the most widely adopted and it's very advantageous to use because it allows to have a mouse line specific for any type of um, uh, cell labeling that we want. And the animals are born already expressing the uh, fluorophore in the specific cell population that we need. Um, however, there are a couple of limitations for our specific purpose, uh, which was that this, um, this type of um, Calcium, uh, genetically encoded calcium indicator requires a heavy manipulation of the genome. And in my case, I have, um, I use mouse models for pathologies that are quite complicated already. And in order to obtain the fluorescent, it would require a lot of different cycles of um, breeding with the G-CAMP line. So that was not really feasible. And the animals that have a very complex pathology usually are really hard to breed. Um, this is why in our case we uh, use a different methodology. In this case we use something called, called um, transverse sinus injections, which was developed in the neighboring lab of ours, and it's based on injecting uh, an adeno-associated virus for GCAMP into the transverse sinuses of P0 pups. What that means is that the BBB at this stage is completely immature, which means that the virus can travel from the bloodstream to the brain, and that grants us a um, full cortical expression of the virus by P6. So in my case, I injected 25 pups, and that yielded a 84% success rate in uh, these experiments. So there are great advantages in using this technique. The first one is that we can use uh, GCAMP viruses but also we can uh, make a cocktail of different viruses that we can inject in the, in, in the transverse sinuses, meaning that we can uh, label different cell populations at the same time. Also, I tried to inject also China rhodopsin for um, optogenetics, and that also works, so we can have full cortical expression of, of China rhodopsin as well. And uh, another great advantage of this technique is that because it's based on adeno-associated viruses, it means that we can inject them into different um, types of rodents and higher order mammals as well. So that's another way that we can translate towards the clinic. So after describing this novel methodology, now I'm gonna talk about uh, the new method, method that I developed for uh, training animals to be awake in the scanner. So most of rodent fMRI is conducted under anesthesia. And that's because uh, motion is one of the biggest problems in the MRI world. And um, rodents like mice are really hard to accustom to be awake in the scanner and not be uh, more stressed and not to move much. So that's why most of um, fMRI in rodents is done under anesthesia to minimize stress, but especially motion. Uh, however, of course, anesthesia affects the brain in ways that are not even completely understood nowadays. And also, human fMRI is mostly conducted in awake condition. So this is why there is more and more of a need of um, shifting towards awake imaging in rodents as well. Um, here I'm going to show you, first of all, we did two imaging sessions, dual imaging sessions, um, on the animals that had transfer and sinus injection, and with the dual imaging system that I showed you before, uh, two dual imaging sessions under anesthesia first. 
So what I show you here is the motion over time. So on the y-axis is how much every brain volume moves compared compared to the other brain volumes over time. And the threshold of 0.1 millimeter means that if the data would go above the threshold, then we can discard that brain volume. So you can see that in an anesthesia, we have very little motion and most of the data is below the threshold. Around 9% of the data was above the threshold, um, which means that we will discard only 9% of the data. After the anesthetized sessions, then we did an initial progressive training for awake imaging. This progressive training consisted of two weeks where we would increase the number of stressors and the level of stressors um, every day a little more. So the first stressor uh, was handling and that went on for four days. Then we restrained the animals for another four days and then we added the LED simulation and eventually the MRI noise. Then we proceeded to do one first awake imaging session. Then we did a refresher training. So we trained the same animals again to refresh their memory for two days. This time we provided all the stressors at full levels for the both two days. And then we did the second awake imaging session. So I will show you here, first of all, the first motion uh, graph from the first awake imaging session. Of course, it, it shows um, quite a, a bit of an increase of motion compared to the uh, anesthetized sessions. But the interesting thing was that after the refresher training, we witnessed a drastic reduction in motion compared to the first awake session. So definitely having the refresher training between the two sessions helped in reducing motion that now is more or less around the anesthesia levels. It's around 9 to 10% of the data to be discarded. One very final thing that I want to discuss here is that if we look at motion in the 3D fMRI data compared to the 2D calcium data, we can see that the big spike of motion that you see here in the top graph is completely uh, disappeared in the 2D calcium imaging data. That can suggest that the motion is mostly to be accounted for in the Z axis. This is the final overview of how the whole project looked and um, so with our three main methodological advances we can really try to bridge the gap between spatiotemporal scales and also between different species. Thank you very much.